Same exact text that we had last week, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Uh, we're digging into that a little bit, talking about the children of God, and we're going to continue that uh, this week and, and possibly next week. I feel like God's still kind of speaking to me a little bit more about that text. And uh, so 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 there. How many of you find different cultures interesting? I do. I find different cultures and different people, and I find all that to be very interesting, very fascinating. Even within our own country, you know, our country is so large that, you know, we, we can have all these different parts, and they're very different, very interesting, different idioms and different accents and things. And my aunt told a story years and years ago when I was a kid, and it's always stuck with me, is that she went... Uh, down south on a vacation and she went into the gas station and she asked for where the pop was and the guy at the counter just looked at her and had no idea what that meant the pop where'd the pop and he just looked at her and she went you know pop and he goes oh soda soda soda's back there I find that very interesting accents southern accents Northeastern New Jersey accents and then my favorite accent of all is the Minnesota oh you betcha yeah very interesting. I love different foods, Italian food, Chinese food, American food, and of course the best food of all, Mexican food. Different groups, different sports. I like soccer. I'll watch cricket, rugby. I think it's interesting. Different art different music, different languages, all these things I find very fascinating. You know, these differences are what make us unique. They're what make us interesting. Imagine living in a world where every single one of us was exactly like everybody else. How boring would that be? How mundane would that be if we were all exactly the same? But even though we are different, we are still connected in a lot of ways. There's always middle ground. There's always areas that we can relate to one another. We all love, we laugh, we struggle, we respect and appreciate each other. We love our family. We love our country. Despite what we're being told in the news today, it's okay to love your country and your culture. We love our faith. We are more alike than we are different. Sometimes, though, we begin to notice that those differences are very deep and on a fundamental level that we don't understand. There are some times and some things that no matter how hard we try, we cannot understand it. We cannot fathom how people understand or see the world and what they think and what goes through their mind. Suicide bombers. I can't wrap my head around that. People who sexually abuse children. I can't understand what's going on in their mind. People that are so filled with hatred that they cannot see past anything else. These things go so much deeper than simply cultural or societal differences. We are now dealing with something on a spiritual level something that has overtaken their hearts. It is a separation that becomes virtually impossible for you and I to understand. It's because it is a spiritual separation. There is a separation between what we are calling here and the Bible calls the children of God and the children of the world. And so we want to look at that divide this morning. So grab your text this morning, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called the children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are called children of God, and it has not yet appeared as to yet what we will be. And we're going to address that part next week. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So let's, first of all, let's look at this separation. 
There has always been a divide between the children of God and the children of the world. But see, we have always assumed that there exists an understanding that is fundamental, a fundamental understanding of basic morality, a basic understanding of right and wrong, that God's law is written on our heart, that we inherently know the difference between right and wrong. Even non-believers could agree on these fundamentals of morality. Have you noticed that disappearing? See, we tend to lean on this humanistic ideology that deep down, all people are what? Good people. We all do that. Even though the Bible tells us over and over and over again that that is a false statement, we all lean on that understanding that all people are good people. People are not inherently good. People are inherently sinful. If you don't believe me, think about this for a moment. If you remove all societal constraints, people will naturally gravitate towards sin. We have witnessed this great experiment over the last year and a half to two years. What happened in Chicago and Seattle and Portland when we completely defunded the police? Did the utopia arrive? No, it did not. We removed the police, crime increases. Because we will fundamentally gravitate towards sin. Decriminalize immoral behavior, immoral behavior increases. See, we believe that all people are good people. Why? Because in times past, we have always been able to relate even with those who believe differently than we do. We've been able to understand our differences, to see where people are coming from, to see their viewpoints, even if we don't agree with them. Have you noticed how difficult that is becoming? We talked about, I mentioned earlier, pedophilia and the sexual abuse of children. And we are watching a world who is trying to decriminalize that who is trying to make that normative all of the time. In fact, California has already decriminalized it. This separation, we can't... How are you getting there? What are you thinking? The disconnect that is happening between the children of the God and the children of the world has becoming overwhelming. It is becoming staggering to where we are no longer understanding each other. We can no longer relate to one another. There is no more middle ground. There's no common ground. I saw a YouTube video. Uh, They do these interviews at college campuses and they go and they begin to talk to them about stuff. And he said that we're going to go out and we're going to try and find ways that we can compromise on the issue of abortion. So he went out and he talked to all these people. What about this? What about this? What about this? And every single issue where there was a point where, because they said, oh, absolutely there's places where we can find middle ground then he brought up every single point one by one and then by the end of the conversation every single one of them said yeah I guess there is no room for compromise there is no there is none we no longer understand each other conversely they can no longer fathom where you and I are coming from Notice that in the media that Christians are painted as redneck, ignorant people that will not accept science, that won't accept all of this, that they're uh, uh, clinging to our Bibles and our guns. This is the picture that is painted of you and I. They don't understand why we think the way we do. They don't understand why we believe the way we do. In our text in verse 1, John says, it is because of God's love that the world does not know us, because it did not know 
him. Last week we talked about this. We talked about the fact that we are recipients of a divine love, that God's love is something that humanity cannot grasp. And the reality of this disconnect is because we are of two different families. We have two different fathers. There are the children of God and the children of Satan. Look at uh, 1 John 3.10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Notice that John acknowledges this chasm, that he acknowledges this difference, that there are both children of God and there are children of the devil. There are children of the world. There are children of wrath. Or if you grew up in what historians refer to as the 1980s, you could say children of the corn. Someone may well say, well, pastor, we're all God's children. We've all heard this. In fact, we've probably been taught this. In fact, many of us have probably said that statement. We're all God's children. But is that a true statement? Is that a biblical statement? We are all God's creation. That's a true statement, right? Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We are all loved by God. That is also a true statement. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, meaning in this tense, humanity, all of humanity, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But are we all children of God? See, that title is reserved for those who have accepted Christ as their Lord. The unsaved are never, ever referred to in the word of God as children of God, never. Rather, they are referred to as children of wrath. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 3, he says, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So Paul makes an, an, the same distinction, but Paul also makes it a point to bring out the fact that all of us prior to Christ were children of wrath. Paul says, yes, there is a distinction between the children of God and the children of wrath, but then he looks at them and says, but don't you dare forget, you too were once a children, a child of wrath. It is only through Christ that we are changed from that into a child of God. It is only, see, we can get into this danger where we begin to think, oh, well, we're better than people because we're children of God. But the reality is we are children of God through the grace and divine love of God, period. Not by anything that we have done. Not because we are better than anything or anybody else. It is by the grace, love, and mercy of God that we have been called out of the world and have been changed and renewed into a child of God and that we can take on and accept the title child of God. Let's look secondly at this new creation here. So in our text, John refers to the, when he refers to the world, he is referencing an evil humanistic condition. It is a condition that dominates societies, cultures, institutions, governments. It is an order that is directly opposed to the Father's will. The children of God are to be radically different from this humanistic condition. We are to be separate from it. Our will must be subservient to God's will. We are to live for him, not to indulge self and our will and our desires. 
It is no longer about us. It is about God and his will. We are no longer children of the world. We are God's children and we seek him and serve him. Remember what Jesus says to Nicodemus. He says to him, he says, you must be born again. In John 3, 6 and 7, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And then he says to him, do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. The phrase born again, probably the majority of English translations of this Greek phrase uses the phrase born again. It comes from the Greek phrase genithea adonen, and it is literally translated as born from above. That's the actual Greek phrase. It means born from above. The literal meaning is to be created new. It is some translations actually translate it that way. You must be born from above or you must be born anew. In other words, what it is saying there is that our current sinful condition is changed spiritually. We are no longer of the world. We are now a child of God. We are completely new and changed. It is here that we become children of God. It is here that we've been accepted and embraced by the divine love of the Father that we talked about last week. We have repented of and rejected the sin of the world. John 1, 12 and 13 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born again, who were created new, not of blood. In other words, not a physical birth, not of the will of the flesh, or by the will of man, in other words, nothing that we can do by our own power, but by God. See, the chasm that exists between the children of God and the children of the world come down to this and this alone. We are not the same. Now, that doesn't mean that we are better than other people. That's when pride and all of these arrogance and things begin to to play in that is sinful and pulls us away from God. But the reality is when we talk about the children of God, we are not the same. We are not to be the same. We have been called out of the world. We have been called to live separately, to be set free from sin and bondage. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, he says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light and darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Bilal? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Then he goes on to say in verse 17, therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. In other words, do not engage in the sins of the world, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me. Now, this does not mean that we don't associate with non-believers. This does not mean that we don't have friends and colleagues who are non-believers. I have friends and colleagues and people that I know and engage with and, and talk to who are not believers, and I love them. They're wonderful people. However, What this does mean is that I do not engage in the sins of the world. When they say to me, hey, 
going to go hang out at the bar. Why don't you come with us? I say, hey, I love you, buddy, but no, I'm not going there. We can go fishing together, but I'm not going to go out and engage in the sins of the world. It means that we do not participate in these things, that we are not embracing the sins of the world, that we are not compromising with the world. The biggest problem with the modern church today is that we are compromising with the world so much. Little by little, it is becoming more and more difficult to see the difference in the church than in the world. Instead of us going out into the world and trying to impact the world, the world is coming into the church and impacting us. The world does not understand the children of God because it does not understand God. This is why Christ tells us that we should expect rejection. We should expect to be hated for our faith. Jesus says in John 15, 18, and 19, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of it, because of this, the world is going to hate you. He says, don't be surprised, expect it. We have to understand, though, it's very interesting that this hatred and this rejection and there are other scriptures in the Bible that talk about it, that it's almost like a good thing. That's weird. Why? Because it is almost like a confirmation that says we are not of the world, that we are, in fact, pulled out and separated, that we are children of God. It's sort of like a proof. Because why? If we were of the world, Jesus says the world would love us. But because the world hates us, it is like saying, yes, they are not of the world and I hate them. And if we are not of the world, who are we of? We are of God. If we are separate from the world, then we are in Christ. I mean, that doesn't mean that I want to be hated and rejected. But when I am hated for Christ, I rejoice. 1 John 3.13, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Jesus says what you need to be worried about is when the world loves you. You need to be concerned when you are embraced by a sinful world. Luke 6.26, Jesus says, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Be worried. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, he said, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who came before you. It's almost like a confirmation. The problem is that too much of today, instead of embracing that and rejoicing and saying, wow, the world hates me because I am of God, but that Jesus said that's going to happen and that I should rejoice because it means my heart is right with God. No, no, no. Instead of that, we don't rejoice in the persecution. We run away, we cower, and we compromise. Please like us, world. Please love us. We'll compromise for you. We'll take those parts out of the Bible that make you uncomfortable. No, we won't. We must stand for the Bible, the word of God in its entirety, no matter, you know, it doesn't, you know, there are things in the Bible that sometimes I struggle to wrap my head around. But you know what? I know that it is the word of God. And I know that it's not about me and my will. It's about God and his will. And when I begin to compromise, I'm hurting myself. 
I'm compromising all that God, when I get to heaven, I do not want to have regrets. I don't want to say, man, I wish I hadn't have done that. I wish I had done that. I wish I had obeyed there. I want to do it at God's will. And I want to stand before God and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's going to become more and more difficult in the coming years to not compromise, to stand for righteousness. The separation is going to become greater and greater and more and more difficult with the hatred and persecution is going to come more and more and more. And we need to prepare for that reality. Not run from it. Prepare for it. It's coming. I want to close this morning. You know, people say, and we we hear this, we say, oh, I hate Christians. I hate Christians because they, they just think they're better than everybody else. How many people have heard that statement? Christians just think they're better than everybody. And you know, the reality is that is simply just incorrect. It's not true. That is a dishonest statement. We engage and in, 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 in communicate and deal with other believers all the time. And we know that that is a dishonest statement. Where is that coming from? Well, it's probably coming from one of a couple of different areas. Number one, this is a person who has been basing Christianity off of one or two bad Christians. They've dealt with or encountered a hypocritical bad Christian, and they're basing and judging all of Christianity off of that. You know, the funny thing is, we're we're allowed to do that with the world. Guess what? We say all people are good people, right? We make that statement. But the reality is we know that, that, that even if we're basing it off of worldly standards when we say that, there are some bad people out there. There are some jerks out there. And you come into the church and you think everybody in there is going to be perfect. Guess what? There are some people who come to church every week that are jerks. And you cannot base all of Christianity off of one or two bad people that you've encountered or one or two hypocrites that you've encountered. And that's what they're doing. Or the second thing that they're doing is that they're living in sin. They want to continue living in sin. And anybody that calls their sin, sin, is a judgmental, horrible believer, Christian. This happens a lot. Someone living a homosexual lifestyle. I love you. Jesus loves you. But that's a sin. And the moment that you say that, you're a hor- you're just judging me. You're a horrible, judging Christian, and you don't love people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because in their mind, Christian love just means accepting and embracing anything and everything. But there are standards that God gives to us that says, this is righteousness and this is sinful. I still love you and care about you. God loves you and cares about you, but this is sin. But no, if you call sin, sin, you're a horrible, judgmental bigoted Christian. And all Christians are like that. No, they're not. True believers are so grateful that God has come into their life. True believers are those that, you know what, the sins in my past, the things in my closet that I look at that are there and I just icky and horrible things I've done, things I've said, I was a sinner, man, I am grateful that God has set me free and changed me. That's a true believer. A true believer is so grateful for what God has done for them and they want God to do that in your life too because we know that he can. A true believer is not someone that looks at their past and thinks that, oh, they're just... A true believer is the one that says, once I was lost and now I am found. The true believer is one that says, Jesus can change your life too. He can set you free. The true believer is the one that recognizes the grace and the mercy of God, and we recognize our need for a Savior. We recognize the fact that on my own, no, I'm on my way to hell. It is through the blood and the grace and the mercy of Christ that I am set free, and I am now called a child of God. And our desire is that every single person we encounter 
could come to know Christ and make heaven their home. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Speaking of the fact that our desire is that everyone would come to know Christ, maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with him. But you want to come to know him this morning. You want to make heaven your home. You want to be altered and changed from a child of the world to a child of God. You want to accept and embrace the divine love of God. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. This is between you and God and no one else. And I would just simply ask you to slip up your hand and make an acknowledgement this morning that you want to get your heart right with our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Speaking to Christians this morning, we should be grateful that we are children of God. We should not be puffed up with pride and think that, oh, look at all of the great things that have happened in my life. Remember, without a doubt, that we are where we are in life because of the grace and the mercy of God. And we should never stop being eternally grateful and seeking his will, seeking his purposes, asking God, you know what, God, all the changes that you've done in me, I know you're still not done with me. Keep working in me, God. Keep moving in my life. I want to seek your purpose and your will. The other thing that we need to stand here and say this morning is don't compromise with the world. Love the world or love the people in the world. Care about them, embrace them, bring them Christ, but do not compromise your faith. I got to spend the weekend alone with my wife this weekend when the kids were at youth conference. I haven't, I don't, I can't tell you the last time that's happened. It was miserable. No. It was wonderful. And we just got to spend time together and hang out and I came home Saturday afternoon and we laid around on the couch and watched movies and we were watching this movie and an inappropriate scene came up. And and do you know what? I didn't have to say or do a thing. My wife knew immediately and said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was in there and grabbed that remote and shut it off. There was no kids in the house. We could have watched that scene and nobody would have known the difference. but we don't compromise in our house. I'm not allowing that into my home. We are compromising too much with these things. Oh, I can watch that stuff and it doesn't have an effect on me. Yeah, it does. Especially if you're a man. Not that it doesn't affect women, but if you're a man, yes, it does. Compromise. What other ways are we compromising? Let's find a place this morning and pray and begin to talk to God about areas that we're compromising in and that we say, you know what, God, I'm not going to compromise with the world anymore because I'm not of the world. I'm a child of God. I am not a child's wrath. I am not a child of Satan. I'm a child of God.